parts is this? A lot. Uh, there is nine Okay, moving on to chapter 34, the protostomes. So my goal is to obviously talk about what protostomes are and then talk about flatworms and show you one of my favorite videos um, to show. And then I might have to shut off the camera for that one. Anyways, and then we have rotifers and mollusks. And then I'm hoping to get through ribbon worms and annelids, but we'll see. All right, so um, just to give you an idea of where we were and where we are going, uh, we just wrapped up our radial symmetry slash asymmetrical animals. Okay, so now we're, we're, we're tackling the protostomes and we're gonna focus on um, Spirulia. Um, so we have platozoas and the Lophotrochozoas. <laughs> So we are going to hit most of these. We won't talk about Micronathozoa and the Cyclophoria, uh, but we will t discuss the other ones. So buckle up. Here we go. Okay, so remember with our Spirulia, these are the embryos that use spiral cleavage. So when they're in that eight-stage cell, or sorry, that eight-cell stage, when it's, go when it's going from four to eight, the cells are askewed. Okay, they're off at an angle, they're not on top of each other. So as a result, you end up with spiral cleavage. Most spirulia do live in the water and they have cilia or some type of constr uh, contraction for how they move. Two clades of spirulians, the, the platyozoans, which is uh, your phylum platyhelminthines, AKA flatworms. And some unique features about the flatworms is very rudimentary body, again, no circulatory system or a respiratory system, but they do have a complex reproductive system. And then we will jump into lophotrochozoans, which we won't finish, um, but two major phyla is the trochophores, which are your mollusca and annelids, and then your lophophores, um, some examples of lophophores, bryozoa and brachiopoda. Now the trochophores, they have some type of free living larva in their life cycle stage, and the lophophores, they are characterized by this horseshoe shaped crown of ciliated tentacles and it's usually around the mouth for filter feeding um, so just differentiating between the trochophores and the lophophores okay yes on the flip side we also have ichthysozoas um, so these are the animals that will molt they shed their external skeleton when they are going through development. And what happens is that their body will swell until the exoskeleton cracks open, and then they kind of try to crawl out of it. Um, and then they will inflate the, the soft new one and it will harden and it has its new exoskeleton. And so we will go in more detail with the molten process when we reach um, arthrop yeah, arthropods and not so much in the nematodes, but definitely arthropods with the insects and crustaceans and all that good stuff. Okay, so jumping into some review questions. Select the statement that is correct concerning protostomes and deuterostomes. It's gotta be what? E. It, e, yeah, E. All of these choices are correct statements. They're uh, each clades, mouth develops first in protostomes, in deuterostomes, the mouth is second. Um, not all bilat bilateral animals can be divided into protostomes and deuterostomes. Um, so, yes. Select the true comment about spirulia. D. D, spiral cleavage as embryos. Select the statement that is not true with respect to the ecdysozoans. Uh, C. C. All right, so uh, nematodes are part of it because it's orthopods and nematodes. Includes the fruit fly. If fruit fly is an insect, so that's an orthopod. It's B, growth is continuous. So when they go through growth, you know, they reach a stage where, hey, I gotta shed my own, my old skeleton. Um, so it's not continuous, it kind of stops and then um, goes on. Hey. Of the following, which are ichthysozoans? Yes, it's A, nematodes. Which of the following attributes, attributes does not belong to lophophores? It is E, all choices do belong to the lo lophophores. All right, so jumping into the platozoans, our flatworms, also known as platyhelminthines. 
um, talk about some distinguishing features, and then um, talk about tapeworms and how the scolex is not a part of the head. So some background, ciliated, soft body, but they are flattened dorsal ventry, squish, hence the term flat worm. Wide variety of marine, fresh water, uh, even in some moist terrestrial habitats, but many here are parasitic. Uh, they are carnivores and scavengers. And they move by ciliated epithelial cells, which you'll see in the movie, just kind of how they just kind of float and, I don't know, wiggle uh, in their environment. I just can't describe it. It's mesmerizing to look at sometimes. Okay, so flatworms do have an incomplete gut, so a digestive ca cavity with a single opening, no circulatory system, but this gut is branched, so it extends throughout the body, so that way gas can be diffused, um, food can be distributed, there are cells um, that line the gut that do phagocytosis to bring in nutrients. Uh, in our flatworms that are parasitic, however, they lack the digestive system um, because they really don't need to. They're, they um, are feeding off of their host. Um, when we get to, I think it's called tube worms, uh, you know, they're in your digestive system, really, so they're just kind of a vacuum, just taking in everything. The mouth is located at the bottom, at mid-body, and I'll show you kind of a diagram of that. Um, but they do have these very strong muscular contractions that allows them to ingest their food and even tear it to bits. Okay, some unique features of flatworms that are involved in excretion and osmoregulation, which just means water balance, flame cells, okay? So you need to know flame cells. Flame cells are these tubules that run um, on both sides of the organism. And this is where water and excretory substances enter and, and leave. Um, so it helps with water balance and then also to get rid of waste products. So these, are, these tubules are called flame cells and you only find them in flatworms, to my knowledge. Okay, nervous system and sensory organs, again, they kind of have a nervous system. They basically nerve cords that run, again, alongside uh, or down the organism, um, kind of like the flame cells. And then they kind of have a bunch of ganglions at co one concentrated region, that anterior region, um, and these eye spots that, can, that uh, detect light. So flatworms in the presence of light, they will move away from it. So, yeah. Okay, so in our previous notes, we said that flatworms um, kind of have a, a unique reproductive system. So most are hermaphroditic, which means they have both male and female sexual structures and, and copulation is required. So here we see internal fertilization. Um, they can also do regeneration which means that you can take the organism and chop them up into tiny little pieces, and uh, each one of those pieces will become a flatworm. It will grow into an individual. So I guess you could say asexual, but you know, they don't cut themselves up. Something has to cut them up. So probably, yeah, it's, this would be up there with probably one of the most complex life cycles among animals. But um, 
Okay, so I have a little comic strip here. It says, tuberella flatworms are hermaphroditic with viable male and female sex organs. Pretty great, I know. But because of this, when it comes to reproduction, who's going to be the mother is up for debate. And it turns out that being pregnant is hard work. So these worms fight it out. And by fight it out, I mean they pull out their dagger like and each try to stab sperm through the other's flesh. Yes, yes. The loser gets pregnant first. The loser gets pregnant first. So I do have a video. If you would like to, uh, and I blocked out the last slide because I probably would get in trouble for it. Um, oops, oops. Okay, hold on here. Let me pull up the video. Uh, you know what? Yeah, you, might as well. Might as well. Oh, definitely need Bluetooth here. Hold on. Oh, there's sound. This is the weirdest. This is the weirdest one. It's normal everywhere in the sciences. Okay. Flatworms have both male and female sex organs. But when it comes time to make little flatworms, they have to decide who plays which role. And that they fight over. The two flatworms rear up, exposing their midsections. Those jutting white nibs aren't weapons, at least not intentional ones. They are actually the worm's penises, a double-barreled inseminator, if they can shoot first. Flatworm sex consists of the two attempting to stab their lover with their pointed pair and inseminate each other, an act delicately referred to as penis fencing. But there's nothing delicate about it. Flatworms have been known to gouge holes in each other in battles lasting up to an hour. Why do they cross swords? Producing offspring requires a lot of energy. The winning father can go out and about in the world without any further responsibility. The losing mother absorbs the winner's sperm. It must now work longer and harder to find food and stay alive. The father floats merrily along. The mother crawls along looking for a meal, already the responsible one. <laughs> now, I actually had a better video because there used, a long, long time ago, there used to be a channel called Spike TV. And they had this like late night TV show and it was kind of like the guy show. And uh, I stumbled across it on YouTube. It's not like I watched the show. I have never even heard of the show, but they actually brought in two flatworms and they were like watching it like an NFL game of these two flatworms, literally fencing. So can't find that video anymore. I've searched high and low, so this is the next best thing. Okay, so. okay, so classes of flatworms. Um, these are the two big classes, the turbella, uh, right, oh, I just said that wrong, turbella, laria, no, turbo, turbellaria, turbo, turbellaria, wow. So our free living flatworms. And then our neodermata, our parasitic flatworms. And the neurodermata, or yeah, the neodermata uh, is actually going to be subdivided in, into two subgroups, which I will discuss in, in this section on the next slide, actually. Um, so our trematoda are the flukes, and then the, oh god, circomeromorpha are your tapeworm and relatives. Um, so one that's just free living, okay, carnivorous. Praise on other um, 
yeah, it's a predator. And here we have the parasitic one. Mm -hmm. So that means that um, they don't have their own digestive system. They are resistant to digestive enzymes and immune defenses of the animals that they prey on. Uh, so yeah. So the subgroups of the Neodermata, the flukes, these guys attach themselves by either suckers or anchors or hooks, and then they take in food through the mouth. Life cycles of flukes usually involve only one host, and it's usually a fish, um, but most do require two hosts. The first is always a snail, and then the second is a vertebrae. So just keep that in mind. Your book does talk about, uh, nope, I'm gonna move on to here, to the Circomeromorpha tapeworms. Okay, so I kind of touched on these two points uh, in the first half. Um, but the body is actually divided into three parts, the scolex, the, the neck, and the proglottids. And the scolex is um, a, the attachment structure. It's usually made up of four suckers, uh, maybe hooks, so four little hooks, but it's not the head. And I just want to emphasize that it's not the head. Um, and then you have the neck that connects the, the scolex to the proglottids, and the proglottids would be just be the repetitive segments that you see on a tapeworm. So, I thought I had a picture, but I guess I'm imagining that. Okay, review questions. Which of these is a characteristic of the plata, platyzoans? B. What? B. B. It's it's B. E. It's actually E. All right, which statement concerning flatworm digestion is not true? It's D. Okay. So, yeah, they don't have a complete gut, so. All right, which of the following is not a characteristic of reproduction in flatworms? Say that again. Oh God. Okay, it's not A. Okay, copulation. That's the internal. That's the. It's not. Is not. It's not C. Yep. It's not E. Okay. So I guess I didn't talk about what happens after insemination. So they do lay eggs. Uh, so it is D. I know. I'm sorry. I just forgot to make note of it. D. D. So A. B, C, D. F, Why do you guys know sign language? G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. This is purple. <laughs> this is mountains. <laughs> okay, true or false, flatworms do not belong to either the spirulia or the agdysozoan and are acelomates. True. 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 <laughs> Okay, still in the platozoans, the rotifers, also known as wheeled animals. So your big objective here is to understand why they are called wheeled animals. So again, bilateral sy symmetry, unsegmented pseudocoelomates. Okay, and the pseudocoelomate um, helps them move. It acts as a hydrostatic skeleton, a tube within a tube, basically. And we'll talk about hydrostatic skeletons when we get to annelids. Um, these are smaller than some ciliated protists. You may have come across the rotifers in your pond dip, if you remember, but that's okay if you don't. Three cell layers, highly developed internal organs. You can see that we have a stomach, we have an intestine, a digestive gland, a complete gut. Locomotion, they have um, cilia that rapidly beats, kind of like boat with oars, and that is why they are called wheeled animals. And then at the very tip, uh, located near the cilia, we have the corona, um, which helps gather food. And it's actually a very complex jaw. Most rotifers are freshwater, hence the pond dip lab. Um, lifespan is no longer than one to two weeks. So your rotifers, if you remember on the pond dip lab, it was like question 10 where it says, list the protists that are actually like animals. Okay, so technically they weren't really protists. They, 
didn't belong to the animal kingdom. But they're very similar to protists. Okay, so a diagram just showing the rotifers again up close. And I mean, to think that these guys are smaller than some protists with all the complexity of these organs, it's, it's kind of mind blowing. It's actually kind of cool. All right, so that is Rotifera. Review question To which phylum do the wheeled animals belong? D. 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 All of the above. Okay, moving on to the. Lophotrochozoans, mollusks. So some defining features, go through the four groups of mollusks and um, kind of elaborate more on cephalopods. So these guys are extremely diverse, probably second to orthropods in the number of species. Um, their size ranges from microscopic to huge, like the giant squid. And the giant squid, you know, could be 15 meters long. So, you know, 15 times 3, 40, 50 feet, you know. Evolved in the oceans, and most of them have stayed there. There has There is one class that is freshwater and terrestrial, and that's our slugs and snails. But some examples of mollusks, just to kind of orientate yourself, oysters, clams, scallops, mussels, um, octopuses, squids. So obviously mo studying mollusks are very important because it's a very uh, important food source for us. We use some of their byproducts in jewelry, but they can also be pests. So that's another reason why we should study them. They damage uh, boats. Zebra mussels belong to mollusca. Snails and slugs can ruin gardens and crops, and uh, there are some <coughs> parasitic mollusks out there. So a diagram showing just the diversity of mollusca. Okay. And so, yes, you will dissect a clam um, and a squid. So you'll actually get to dissect two types of mollusca. OK, so the body plan is complex, and it does vary. Uh, but for the most part, they do have bilateral symmetry. There is an exception um, with gastropods. Gastropods, as you will soon learn, are snails. And they've actually lost their symmetry because their mouth or their butt, I don't remember which one, uh, kind of goes off to the side. So it's not a perfect bilateral symmetry. Another thing you'll see in the mollusca body plan is the coelom. The body cavity is reduced, <clears throat> especially around uh, the heart and some excretory organs like the um, kidneys here and part of the intestine. Um, so yes, the, the coelom here is this light blue area and it is reduced in size. Okay, so I'm going to go through um, some internal organs. So they do have digestive organs, excretory organs, reproductive organs, and it's all concentrated in the visceral mass, which is highlighted in red down here <clears throat> in the snail and um, up in the squid. All mollusks have a muscular foot, and this is their primary mechanism for movement. Um, so in clams, it kind of looks like a tongue, and it's, I mean, they, they stick it out of their shell and they push themselves uh, in the sand or help you know, bury themselves. In cephalopods, the muscular foot has been divided into tentacles or arms, however you want to describe it. So uh, more functions, you know, not just locomotion with propulsion, but attachment and food capture. And then gastropods, they use their foot to um, secrete mucus and then they glide on top of that mucus. So movement, you know, all through the four classes of mollusca, um, but just slight variations between cephalopods and gastropods. They do have a differentiated head at an anterior end of the body, um, a mantle. Now, for the, the snail and the clam, the bivalves, the mantle is kind of the, the shell. Um, but it, it aids in protection, but it does have openings for the excretory reproductive systems and digestive systems. 
Um, inside the mantle, you will find its circulatory or organs known as tenidia, and that is depicted uh, here. You can see it's very filamentous, allows for a lot of gas exchange, increases surface area for that, um, and so that is depicted here, this blue feather-like area. If they have a shell, um, it is made up of calcium carbonate, and it's in layers. Um, calcium carbonate crystals layered on top of um, some type of protein structure, this protein called conchin. And that pearly appearance that you see is um, from nacre. So this is how pearls are formed. I'm sure you guys have all heard how pearls are formed in clams. Um, some type of foreign object, a grain of sand, is lodged in the mantle and the inner shell. And then what the mantle does to protect itself is it covers that grain of sand uh, with layers upon layers of this nacre, which is conchin and calcium carbonate, to reduce the irritation. And as a result, you end up with a very pretty substance that you know we use in jewelry. All right, <coughs> feeding and capturing prey is mostly done by the radula. Can I move on? No, okay, that's okay. You shook your head no. So can I move on? Yeah, you do. Okay, the radula, it's a tongue-like organ. Um, obviously this cartoon diagram is an over-exaggeration of it, but when you zoom in on this electron microscope uh, slide, yeah, that looks pretty raspy and uh, abrasive to me. So it's made up of many microscopic chitinous teeth arranged in these rows. And if the organism is bethnic, which means it kind of lives on the bottom of a surface, you know, a lake bed, however, they will scrape algae off. Gastropods tend to drill holes through shells of their prey, and some actually are equipped with harpoon and venom uh, to go through those uh, holes. However, you do not see the radula in bivalves. Okay, so no radula in the bivalves. Okay. Removal of waste, nephridium, key term here, associate nephridium with your uh, mollusca here. Um, it's a kidney-like organ and kidneys help get rid of those nit nitrogenous waste. Um, so what makes up the nephridium, a nephrostome, basically a funnel-like substance filled with cilia and it's connected to the bladder. So the nephridium here is in yellow helps get rid of nitrogenous waste. Circulatory system is open. So remember we talked about two types of circulatory system, open versus closed. In open, it means that the blood will pool into sinus-like areas and then go through vessels again, where closed blood travels completely in vessels. Um, but the coelom, which is the body cavity, is reduced, especially around the heart region. The you know, mollusks, their, their heart is made of three chambers, two that collect blood from the gills, and then one that pumps to the body tissues. And we don't really call the blood blood. Uh, they are called hemo hemolyph. So the sinuses that um, are part of the open circulatory system is called the hemo hemocele. So there are several sinuses and networks of vessels, especially in the gill area where gas exchange takes place. Okay, one more body system before we get into the four classes of mollusks, mollusks reproduction. So there are distinct male and female individuals. There are a few out there that are hermaphroditic. They do engage in external fertilization, which means the gametes get released in water and then they will mix. And then um, that zygote, after fertilization occurs, goes through spiral cleavage and develops into the trochophore. And so trochophores is the free swimming larvae by means of cilia. And then it will go through a second stage called the villigare. And from the villigare, it will form your foot, shell, and mantle. Um, so if you come, stumble across a question that says, what are the three parts of um, mollusks, what are, what's the basic body plan of a mollusk? It would be these three. Okay, all of them have some type of foot. All of them have a shell, 
or it's been reduced. I'll talk about that in cephalopods. And then a mantle. So the foot, shell, and the mantle make up your mollusks. Gastropods um, do not do external fertilization. They are the only class that does internal fertilization, and it's so that way uh, the gametes don't desiccate or dry out because they live on land. So because of internal fertilization, a foot that can help them glide on the surface of mucus and a type or a efficient excretory system, they've been able to colonize land while the other three have not. Okay, so the four classes of mollusks um, actually it lie seven to eight, but we're just going to talk about four. So these are the four polyplacophora, which is your chitons or your chitons. I'm not exactly sure how to say that. Gastropodia, your snails and slugs. Your bivalves, which are uh, shells, two shells that you know hinge together and they open up, so clams, oysters, scallops. And then your cephalopodia, which are your squids and octopi. Cuttlefish and the chambered nautilus are also included in class cephalopodia. Okay, all right. So, uh, moving on to the first class called the polyplacophoria. The reason why they are called polyplacophoria is poly means many and placo means plates. And so uh, they, they are this oval shaped organism that has uh, eight overlapping dorsal calcareous plates. So they're made up of calcium carbonate. Not, but they are not considered segmented, and they kind of just creep along the bottom of their habitat. Um, they graze. So the herbivores that graze on shallow marine habitats. Okay. Second class, gastropodia, your snails and slugs. Most have a shell. Slugs and sea slugs have actually lost their shells, as you can see up here. They creep on their foot, can be modified for swimming head with a pair of tentacles with eyes at the base of those tentacles and they act as chemo or mechano uh, sensors. Here's where they are not bilaterally symmetrical, it's called torsin. Um, so when they were going through embryological development, um, the, the, so it's the anus moved from the posterior location to the front and it's closer to where the mouth is and it's kind of just off to the side. Um, their shell is produced by coiling um, and you can also find coiling in some cephalopods. Okay, I think that's all I needed to say. So just a diagram of your gastropod here, showing the, um, this would be the anus up here. Um, I thought I had a better diagram. All right, moving on to the third class, bivalves. So they have two lateral left and right shells, and we call those shells valves. Hinged dorsally, so it's on the back. So when you open up your clam, you will actually um, kind of have to uh, cut through some very thick muscles to unlock the hinge. No distinct head or radula. 
wedge-shaped foot that's used for burrowing or anchoring, and then uh, two very important features here, inhaling and exhaling. So these siphons act as snorkels, um, they, they filter feed and they bring in oxygen for the body. So you'll actually see these siphons, one, one will be the inhalant and the other one will be exhalant, but they're basically pairs of siphons. So water will move in one direction and out the other. Okay, so a diagram showing um, the anatomy of a bivalve and here is the incurrence, so siphon, it will travel through and then it will exit out the top here. Just another diagram. Just lots of different ways to, uh, to show clams. Okay, the fourth class and the final class, cephalopodia, oct octopuses, squids, and, and the nautilus. Uh, so the big thing you need to know here is the number of arms or tentacles. So squids have 10, octopuses, eight, and then your nautilus, 80 to 90. Okay. These guys are predators. Um, their foot has been subdivided into their arms. They can be used for suction cups, adhesive structures, uh, or even hooks to help them snare their prey. Um, their mouth is kind of made up of these beak-like jaws, and that's um, basically the development of their radula. So the radula kind of make up these jaws. Very highly developed nervous system, extremely intelligent. I'm sure you have seen videos of them escaping out of uh, aquariums. If you remember in Finding Dory, there was an octopus that was pretty smart. You know what, they mo that's, that's true. There's been octopuses that have escaped their tanks, uh, killed sharks and other larger predators, and then they go back to their tanks and they're like, what the heck happened to the shark? Who, where did all the fish go? What's going on? And then they go back in the camera and they're like, oh my gosh, that sneaky SOB, right? Um, eyes are very elaborate. Their eyes are more advanced than our eyes, um, so. Yeah. You know what? I think I'm gonna. I'm just gonna end it right here. So we are on slide 41. Uh, bells. The bell I think is gonna be off. Um, so yeah.